Security Nightmares with Ron and Frank. Very good. Thank you. Not too dark, please. And as has been said already, we would like to have the cyber. We'd like the audience to, to whisper the word cyber, 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 cyber. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Right. Now, this is the 20th edition in decimal anniversary. For those that like decimals, I've almost forgot. I almost forgot. Last time we were using octals and then sometimes hexadecimal numbers. And then suddenly I, I, I didn't realize that until I noticed, oh, 20, that is kind of important too as well. So that's why we have a 20 year look back shortly, but that will be an exception. We won't do that every year. Who here is here for the first time? Okay, nice. What was that, a third? 20 to 25%. Who was there at the first time? For those that can still calculate this, that was in 16 C3 at the Haus am Kölnischen Park in Berlin. Who was there? Ah, oh, yeah, five. Imagine that. And then who wasn't born by that time? More. Actually, if you go back 20 congresses, including this one, it would be 17. Okay, back then in the house at Kölnische Park, there were about half as many people as are in this hall, just in this hall right now. That was the overall audience. In 1999, before the turn of the millennium, that was the first time we used the NNC3 acronym or abbreviated acronym and the second event and the Haus am Kölnischen Park in Berlin, very nice location and we had half as many people there as fit into this hall alone and that was in the whole house and it felt rather full. Yeah, because you have to know that the Haus am Kölnischen Park had a large hall and that could fit so many people, uh, as many people in as would fit into the whole of the Eiderstädter Bürgerhaus, the first location in Hamburg. Could someone just do the calculation there? Where we will be in 20 years from now? Okay, but we are post-growth now. We noticed that this growth thing is difficult. The planet is going to be exhausted at some point, so we'd better not grow anymore. Right. Okay. And the Congress was only three days back then. So you could do this in one go without sleeping. Who of you have tried in the four days? Ah, come on, yeah, be embarrassed. No, they're not here. They're just lying around anywhere, dazed. Right. I can remember when I was at a four-day congress for the first time and I thought, oh, that can't be true. That's just an attack on your health. Uh, yeah, I think this correlation, we went to four days and the cert grew massively. I think that is no coincidence. But at the end, it's good, right? Four days. Who believes that it's a crime to hackerdom to be kicked out after four days. So that's half of you. Who would like one month of Congress in a, in a row? Right. So that's two thirds again, or something like that. Yeah. Seamless transition from camp to Congress. 
Well, th that is a good idea because 1999 was the year when the first camp took place. Who was there? Ah, oh, yeah. Five. Again. Right. Now, those are the veteran uh, spectators, or uh, no, not just spectators. So what was the big issue in 1999? That was, of course, the year 2000. Who still regrets the purchase of a generator? Well, no, not regret. I didn't pay for it anyway because the company bought it. Uh, uh, bought it simply went bust in January, uh, and they had ordered it. <laughs> And didn't pay the pill. So next year will be a leap year. So if you are, <laughs> if you're going to be staying overnight from the 28th to the 29th of February to the 1st of March, take an extra roll of loo paper. Yeah, the year 2000 was one of the first topics where this dependency of IT kind of entered the public conscience because of that panic. And to, until now, it's not quite clear whether that was a panic that was unjustified or whether the panic made sure that enough energy and time and money was spent to prevent it from being a problem. And I think up to now that is has not been clarified and we are all looking towards the year 2038 with great glee, which is coming closer. So 2038 is closer to us now than the first security nightmares are away from us by now, just as a point of reference. Right, so um, we were sitting around there and listening to Professor Brunstein's talk with a certain sense of horror, who, would, who explained to us how the world would end, and well, right, those were the days. Right. The shocking thing is that the years from 1999 to 2019 can be summarized in a single image, a screenshot. <laughs> Warning, the document you're opening contains macros or customizations. Some macros may contain viruses that could harm your computer. If you're sure this document is from a trusted source, click Enable Macros. If you're not sure and want to prevent any macros, to click this Able macros, macros. When we prepared, we were kind of miffed by the fact that in those 20 years, we haven't had any real progress on this front, which what we had is massively this year was several ransomware attacks, which for the largest part still are transported via office macros as a transport vector. And that was n was not any different in 1999. In between, it was a bit less, but by now we're back at the very same issue. And we have to ask, is this humani humanity actually capable of learning? How many out there in, in business will vomit if they hear, dear Microsoft, for the sake of humanity, just switch off macros completely? And the problem with that is probably quite a few bullshit business would break. All this reporting sheets and those 400 megabyte Excel documents that large corporations are run with. It's not a joke. Living Excel documents, they change, uh, which change when you put something in and 15 sheets along, something else changes, you have to react to that. So that's not a rare experience out there. So if you think if those were all gone, not too many people will die, I think. Although I don't know. Hospitals maybe have office macros, macros too. So people might, those might only die later or something. Yeah, so you shouldn't make too many jokes there. Oh, come on, kick them while they're down. Right, now about the regular program of 10 years ago. That's a regular issue. 10 years ago, we were talking about cloudy computing and thought that malware and the cloud would converge. And who of you have seen this come to reality, become a reality? Yeah, eight. 
The message was, I think, that a lot of malware would be migrating into the cloud and the cloud in its perhaps non-security would become a problem. But in fact, I think we've observed something else. It looks a bit like if only the cloud is the thing that can be defended, or at least many try to create that impression. Right, well, on the other hand, all those antivirus snake oils, oil things went into the cloud. They are now all selling cloud antivirus, and and they all are selling cloud everything, cloud everything. Yeah, hypervisor rootkits is something that we announced at the time. We just had debated this for a while. How did we actually reach that impression? And we then found that, yes, of course, they exist. There are some toolkits with which you can break out of those hypervisor frameworks. But in the wild, they are quite rarely used because the necessity of such a hugely elegant solution simply does, isn't there because the thing that's within those virtual machines is so bad that it simply is not worth the effort to go that go through that uh, go th to go that long way and uh, that's how wrong you can be. So realistic assumptions about software quality. I think we've learned that shitty security nightmares never turned into reality. That's right. So the question is, if Office macros would no longer be around. Would we have this instead? This, uh, the search engine user profile ob obfuscation, the idea here was that you were sitting in front of your search engine and asking one question after the other, and that, of course, is every question to Google is an answer to Google. That was the motto. And so how do you obfuscate yourself? And I have to say, I haven't seen any plugins that simply is searching for Britney Spears in between or whatever is current at, at the time, some, something harmless. I think if you would search for Britney Spears these days, a bizarre fetish would be assumed. Uh, so that was 10 years ago, of course. That was the message then. Um, right. Street View was a, an issue 10 years ago. That kept Germany, that burnt Germany so hard that Google now would rather not publish anything and everyone else d didn't take part either. Mm, my impression, but that's maybe just my filter bubble, my impression is that everyone's kind of regretting this, that everything is just rotting there in Street View and nothing's updated. Well, actually, I think that is quite interesting. To, this is a kind of living archaeology. You can see how it looked like a few years ago, what has changed since then. Uh, well, right, uh, the problem is that Street View by then was state of the art, and these days we have, when we looked in preparation, current aerial imagery. The platforms have a 10 centimeter resolution, so you're not quite there with, with reading number plates yet, but not that far either. And what is actually fascinating here is, I think it was this year that we had the discussion, what's it like about aerial images? They are always getting better. And I think Bing started this. They, how did they call it? Bird view? And Apple is calling it flyover or something. And they really have good data there. and. Uh, Nothing is pixelated. At least I didn't find anything. And this outcry that went through Germany back then, I have to pixelate my house, that seems to have, through those aerial images, that just seems to have evaporated. Did we have anything? I think that has two reasons. The one reason is, with aerial images, you have the top view, maybe a bit of a side view, but you can't really read writings, no number plates, you can't really recognize faces that way. And the algorithms that uh, that they put in about articulating faces and number plates, uh, they do need some time to, to get there. Uh, there was this whole thing, I'm going to pixelate the whole storefront, 
But I think that the development will be quite quick if 5G is rolled out. Uh, yeah, there are devices that say, OK, 5G, huge bandwidth. We can put in this, this 360 degrees cameras and put them on taxis or uh, bin collecting trucks and have a live update of Street View. They're just streamed out via 5G and then paste it there. And, and of course, then we will need those algorithms to pixelate images because of data protection and paste to pixelate faces. And that opens interesting perspectives because with your storefront, if you don't want to be in that uh, live stream, you have to take the font that is used for number plates and <laughs> set up your storefront with that. And that will automatically get pixelated. And that will then lead to number plate wallpaper that you paste to your house, perhaps to make it disappear. And clearly, uh, it's not over yet. The issue has just been dormant. The live street view thing will come, and uh, the aerial images are one pathway that they are sneaking in now. Um, the flash mob renters and our bot herders, the botnet defense federal care people, that was just an announcement at the time. So that was the botfrei.de, botfree.de was started just a year later. And the reason, of course, was that that was the year of the Configure virus. And we were told that 5% of business PCs are infected. And Germany was on the second at on rank two with of countries with the most botnet infections. And then the things were done, and uh, a few years later, Germany was out of the top 10. And until now, it isn't in the top 10 now either. So the whole thing was kind of scaled down. And the interesting thing is that Japan, last year, the in Japan, the government authorized itself to scan for IOTs, and they started this year, I think. I haven't seen any results yet. I assume that they are trying to catch people that have bad passwords with IoT devices and contact these people, as we've seen with infected system systems. So I think next year we'll have an update on that. Yeah, we already had that topic back then. It was about intelligent electrical uh, meters. The discussion of the conflict between the environment and data protection. The, the question is, if we want to save the planet, is it justified to implement a surveillance state kind of initiative? Um, do we need that in order to uh, comply with environmental regulations that are important? And the societal movements that are advocating for that kind of thing might have to have a stronger discussion or a more focused discussion on this topic. Uh, if you look at the political spectrum on the very on the green uh, part of this, so the environmental parties, they may not hold the data privacy aspect in as higher regard if the trade-off is against the environmental issues that we're looking at. So this is a topic that we will have to discuss some more in the coming years. And there will be, uh, it will be hard to find a consensus in that regard. It's if we we're still worried about the, uh, the very uh, data protection aspects for the citizen. We had malware with update cycles of weeks or one week back then. We're down to uh, the question of an hour or uh, sometimes even less. This is uh, good progress, obviously. Uh, we thought that the electronic health insurance card is dead. You may want to just have a look at the uh, talk at the Congress this year. There was a talk on the electronic health insurance card and build your own opinion on that. There's the internet normality update for 2019. We're just going to throw out a few numbers. For example, 
there was this Microsoft RDP vulnerability, it was called Blue Keep. When it was published or put out there, there was roughly a million systems that were immediately vulnerable. That's roughly the order of magnitude we usually talk about, even though a lot of malware is still uh, replicating quite happily, even if you only just have a few 10,000 systems. Then there was Gantt Crab. It was a larger number in, in the matter of how much money was earned. It's in the ransomware corner. Those numbers are put out there by the group who published the exploit. So this is interesting because it was only running 16 months and they claim to have earned about 160 million US dollars. The question, so the, the other side, the victims claim that they had almost 10 million in damages. So those numbers don't really match up. And it's, the question is, is this really profit <laughs> after, after calculating the, the numbers? If, did you discount all the effort you had to put in, all the money you spent along the way? Is this proper bookkeeping you're doing? Or did you round up or down? It's clear that the companies say it's vastly more expensive because they had to do something new while they were, or basically they pushed in something that they wanted to do all along and they, this was just an opportunity that they had now. So they had, the, the numbers just don't match. What's your view on this? Did, did, were you affected? Did you have, do, do you have a friend of a friend who was affected by ransomware? Oh, so few people. That's at most a hundred people. So who knows a company that was affected by a ransomware attack? Oh, that's a vastly larger number. So who knows a person or a company that actually paid up? Oh, that's not actually few, maybe 15. And how many stars would you give their support system? Customer service? Five stars? So the basic the industry will have to explain how you reach them. They have a lot to do. And uh, of course, yeah, the question about customer service, did the data come back? Who? knows anyone who got their data back. Yeah? So customer support is has room for improvement. Yeah, there were numbers that we saw. I found basically jumped out of the internet at me. It was an office in Florida that has paid up 600,000 US dollars and ransom. There were a few others that paid roughly 400k. Did anyone hear of a larger sum than that? Is it official? It's not official, but I heard... I know of people who have, are tasked with dealing with the fallout of this and cleaning it up. They claim that there was one company at least that basically just took their share of the of the revenue that the company generated. So they took something like 2% from the numbers that they have in the balance sheet and used that as the demand that they put out in the ransom notice. So if you think about it, if, if you have an outage in production and it lasts for a day, then maybe that's roughly a percent in cost that they incur or lost revenue. So it, the ransomware topic is one of the points where the, the, the claims that we made in the last few years actually were pretty spot on. Was the, the mail actually affected too? Oh, nice, a postcard, thank you. A very nice postcard. Time travel is not a crime. Yeah, we'll talk about that later.
This, this ransomware attack, not all of it is ransomware. Some of it is actually targeted attacks on companies where it's then spreading out. They, they're looking for the weakest point in the company. They attack that spot, for example, something that uh, sends parcels or something and you for example you 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 kill that fulfillment position or maybe it's the finances you, you t hit them where it hurts and you can see that all the technological debt you have incurred over the years that you've been keeping around and you don't solve it's basically coming back at you now and we've been asking ourselves why over the last few months there were so many r ransomware incidents that have affected hospitals and uh, similar universities and similar um, endeavors. Those have the oldest IT systems with little uh, hope for betterment. So basically they're the weakest her uh, members of the herd and they are being culled. So they obviously they, they have to uh, discount it in their credit, uh, in their balance sheet but in the end they're more willing to pay because it's easier so these ransomware attacks now they create an intrinsic motivation to take care of your IT system so maybe it may have positive effects in the end for the individual uh, well, office or company the ransomware infections rose in over 350%. The bug bounties are rising as well. Apple also joined the game with 1.5 million US dollars for a zero day. In 2019, we had 19 zero days that made it into distribution. In 2018, it was only 12. So maybe for some of you this year was uh, a little busier than usual, but maybe not as much as in 2017 when it was 22 of them. The average cyber damage in Germany is around 2 million euros. And every eight German company was affected by some form of cyber attack. Those are numbers where you're saying every eighth did the others not read any emails or are these numbers just off or strange? These numbers coming from industry political agencies um, they're saying that the total number of damages due to cyber attack are in the two figure billions how, how are they calculating it? You really have to ask yourself So it's more interesting to look at what else is in there and yeah, the basically the calls for help from the industry that someone, maybe not the state, was going to go out there and regulate that whole thing. So maybe that's just the growing despair of the security officers in the companies that they're not getting the money from the CEO or the board or whoever and they're basically looking at other uh, branches of the industry that are more heavily regulated and they're kind of jealous because they're hoping for more regulation that would allow them to get the budget for the security that they need. So let's look back at 2019. So the chamber court of Berlin, they had a terrific task of de-dusting fax machines. Actually, no, that I don't think they had to de-dust them. They were perfectly maintained. If anything is properly maintained and de-dusted, it's the fax machine. Did they increase the lines by 10? Uh, by a factor of 10 or get something out of the basement or what did they do? Well, they didn't have one stack of paper but a whole pallet and they put the people there to keep putting the paper in, the fax machine. There's this stupid phrase from lawyers that goes, the electronic transfer of documents made it possible 
to make legal papers escalate in size so much because otherwise you earlier you had to get it through in time so there was a limit on how many hundreds of pages pages you get, get transmit in a few hours so if i'm if i keep myself short i can hand it in later right now the e-voting isn't really going away in switzerland we had the attempt to uh, which badly failed also thanks to the great work of the Swiss CCC members. An applause. And the same company that was the Spanish company Skytel, then, well, they are these zombies. They just don't go away. They do this web server-based e-voting and the German Social Democrats were, were enticed to do that when they asked their members who should lead them this year, who should be the next leader. We criticized it heavily, and they always responded, ah, oh, come on, it's not, it's not just a real election. It's just a survey of members' opinions, which the party will then implement. Uh, and that won't go away. They will go on zombieing around. And uh, the question now will have to be asked, uh, one of our predictions is becoming true. If you have digital voting votes, how can you prove that nothing, the election has been tampered with? And we've seen this in Bolivia. In Bolivia, yes. The president was uh, voted out because they ran an election with a digital system and someone said this election was tampered with. There was electoral fraud, and no one was able to say, no, there wasn't. It was impossible. You could only determine that the system was as broken as all the other digital systems. And and that narrative of, we know that, that's, that's been, that there's been fraud came about. So as soon as you have digital voting and someone later says electoral fraud, you've lost. Yeah. And then this fascinating topic with those uh, ring cameras, the issue of password quality and uh, software vulnerabilities, but much more exciting was what happened in the US, where there was this unholy alliance between police forces, local forces, and the makers, if I understood it correctly. And you are being made to give the police access to cameras, to your own cameras. And I think what can be foreseen here is that this will be so an issue of social pressure. We have these neighbor associations in the better, better of American suburbs, and there are rules there how you should design keep your house and garden intact in order to not degrade the value of the other houses in the neighborhood. So don't have your lawn grow any longer because that will degrade the value of the surrounding houses and that's not on. And it's completely foreseeable that soon we'll reach a state that these people say, oh, come on, we are a ring neighborhood. We all have these cameras and they will all be linked up to the local police department and you can then imagine the black mirror scenarios that will come from that. Someone runs away and then the cameras in the neighborhood will watch if that face is picked up somewhere and so on. So these, the cameras that stream directly to the cloud, that is a phenomenon that we should really keep in mind. We've been warning about this for, for many years and now it is really happening. In the Asian area, Asian region, uh, you have companies that sell you a camera that streams into the cloud and out of all video images, it, they cut out everything that looks like a face and put it in the cloud. And if any face is recognized and, and it's determined that this person was under suspicion as a shop lifter, uh, the shop owners will get a message saying, hello, the person that you've we've seen on your camera has been uh, recognized as a shoplifter somewhere else. And that is a service that is being paid for. And, and the state, of course, has access to these data. And 
can also feed data into the face recognition. Whether that is only 50% correct or not, it doesn't matter, as long as the system looks as if it would add value. And this integration of state surveillance and private surveillance with the companies that build technology, and that these are, for, are forming a kind of conglomerate, that, that is something we will see much more. And we have to get used to the fact that this state versus industry thinking is not going to be applicable anymore. It's going to be a one huge conglomerate. And if security is so bad that you cannot make sure that every second image will be one of Donald Duck, that is going to be the challenge. Now, data wealth. All kinds of data wealth this year, of course, it's clear. The remarkable thing, perhaps, uh, was that was two issues. One, that 30 terabytes of data from the top three antivirus makers were carried out. That is quite a good achievement. Whether they are not using their own products, could that be? Maybe the license expired. And the other thing that I found quite crazy was that uh, some security researchers found a pot of data that wasn't properly, pro properly secured. It contained data from 80 million U.S. households, all complete with date of birth, address, GPS data, and income, and things like that. And that, it seems, was lying around in a Microsoft cloud thingy. And with those data, they could not determine who it belonged to. It was just, hmm, that's data. Large file, the format was published on, on the website, redacted, and there was a call for people to help to find the source. And the only thing that happened was that Microsoft quickly shut down the server, and those that uh, were going to get billed for that server were notified, but they didn't say who that was. Who that was. So that question is still op open and unresolved. And this will happen more often. You can be sure that this will happen more often, and data will appear, and people will say, wow, that could be belong to a bank, maybe not, maybe a tax a counseling company, whatever, right? So maybe that will be a new classic as well. How do these things come about? Someone needs a bit of backup space, and the IT says, well, the new network attached storage will only be complete in four weeks, but my deadline is next week, so what do we do? We just click a, us a bucket somewhere and upload it there. We don't need any crypto. We only do it for two days anyway, and we don't need security either because it will take longer then, and we'll delete it surely. And uh, then on Friday night, someone says, have you deleted the data? Yeah, I'm going to do it soon, yeah. And then the coffee cup is knocked over, and he's dealing with something else, and then goes on holiday, and he's gone, and the data remains. Right. And depending on what credit card this is, someone will notice or not, and such a lot of things will disappear that way, and you won't know what it is. One of the things that were very, that they, they were showing this zombie-like characteristics this year again was the discussion about uh, increased back doors, uh, back increased and uh, severe severe uh, backdoors in certain software and the plot usually works like this the the government or some one of their their organs says we don't want the encryption to become any weaker because obviously we, we have attackers like the Chinese or the Russians but we want some of the companies like the the larger basically uh, you can Google Amazon Facebook the, the, the regulars they should build their encryption in a way that it has a backdoor that enables the law enforcement agencies to take a peek and that basically they shouldn't build it, build anything special but rather what they're saying is maybe just add another key you don't need any special access method another key for example would be fine that the government has access to and then they can just take a look 
and the discussion is uh, rather rather severe in the US. The representatives of the companies feel pressured and put on the spot, and they're being forced to come up with a solution for this, and there's, they don't want the responsibility, and the, the, the government basically said, yeah, solve the problem, we don't care. But they also put uh, timelines on it. There's deadlines, for example, by the Senate, where they were grilling Apple, Facebook, maybe some more. And the demand was clear. Well, relative. It was, it was crystal clear. If you don't enable us by the same time next year uh, some way to do this, we are going to regulate you. Well, we're here next time. Uh, same time next year, and then we can take a look what happened. So, the discussion is also going on in Germany. There's also a bit of a, a row between the law, law enforcement agencies and some companies to enable them. And the, it is not so much a matter of what it looks like in the specific countries, it, it will be a little different. Um, for example, if you have a chat, then they should, for example, put in a ghost participant in the chat who will just read and whose key will be uh, added to the conversation so they can later on look at what was said. And the problems that are showing themselves here um, are that over the short or long term encrypted communication made available by commercial companies that are not regulated or that are regulated even um, cannot be viewed as secure anymore. If they submit to this kind of regulation, for example, Apple, Google, whatever, and they have so many million users that are being affected by this, then these companies are n not actually allowed anymore by law to create actually secure encryption. So people who are in need of secure communication actually need to uh, utilize offerings by smaller companies that are unaffected by the regulation. And the, the issue is Basically, the, the state is not happy with the state as it is, even after the the uh, the leaks made available by Snowden that showed us what, what happened. And we're still discussing this under the topic of responsible encryption. We probably need to speed up a little bit. So some, some more interesting stuff that we want to discuss. We can learn more from the reports from the breaches there were several of those, probably more than over the last few years. So if you're interested, maybe Google the uh, specific companies that were affected. For example, data breach report for the companies Equifax, Mask. It's very interesting. Some of the other companies noticed that it's nice for the marketing and for... Um, for keeping the customer relation intact if they're very open about what happened and how they reacted to the cyber breach. And it is very, very uh, insightful to look at what they put out there and you can learn a lot from it. There was this super critical IRS security gap that was called Checkmate in the bootloader that Apple probably won't be able to patch and is only uh, fixed starting iPhone 11 and onwards. And that is actually really bitter for us. It's not the last time this is going to happen, that's for sure. It only lasts for a while, usually. The next discussion that is really interesting is, <laughs> and it has been almost emotional, is DNS over HTTPS, so encrypted name resolutions. In, in my view, it's similar to TLS forward sec secrecy. Crypto is becoming better. 
well, even communication as a whole, the transmission of data, encryption, a lot of people say, yeah, well, that's annoying. I have to buy something new in order to uh, take a peek and I need it for my security and I some people say they need the money in order to support their business model to sell the data, which may, for example, for DNS be quite relevant for the ISPs in the US. In Germany, it's not allowed, at least the telcos aren't allowed. But yeah, well, for enterprises, it's more of a nuisance. They can sort of adjust their way of working and put out uh, a better method of distributing software or have policies in place or some other method. But the companies that are really affected by this are the data traders. And some other ones that are pissed off about this are the companies, uh, the, the, the governments that want to listen in on the conversations. And yeah, that may not be a bad thing. So. I want to throw in just this for a little bit. The first recall of an of a piece of medical security gadget, basically. It was 2017 that was by the FDA. It's crazy how long this takes. So this particular radio insulin pump that where we only had a voluntary recall, the security researchers had to be persistent about this for two and a half years in order to 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 put pressure on them to get the FDA to do it. And this is only the tip of the iceberg. We really don't know what's out there that should really be recalled because it's unsecure. We're also observing that the topic of, of automation and distribution of work among the malware producers, so the basically the industry in the dark sector, is pushing themselves to new heights. And Frank already said that the weakest ones are going to be polished off. But yeah. The one that got removed recently wasn't actually the weakest, but still. So the companies are going to take a look and they're going to evaluate what they really need and they're going to say, okay, we need to recover the systems faster. Maybe we need an Active Directory as a hotspot that we can just throw in the network when it's needed. And maybe you can already take the stance that if you have a, a smaller or a medium-sized incident, you can basically say, okay, we're not going to pay anything. We don't care. Go for it. So the industry is seeing these, this, these trends and they're increasing their efforts from ransom to blackmail. So basically before they encrypt them, they're taking the data out and they're not just saying, if you want your data back, if you want it, you need to pay us X amount of Bitcoins. But their companies are saying, yeah, well, we still back up. We don't care. And then the, the ransomware uh, folks are just going to say, yeah, we also have your backups. And maybe other people are interested in what you have in your backups. So what, you, what they're doing is basically a, a torture by a thousand cuts where the affected company is it gets to the point where they're saying maybe it might actually be better to pay up instead of being uh, hurt anymore. It's a rather traditional model of doing business, but it's coming back at in these in this new way that we're seeing in the ransomware sector. So we're gonna just skip this. Yeah, stealing metadata. Interesting is. There are now products with more than one backdoor because during production of the product, more than one person was involved or agency actor maybe that all put in a backdoor. So there's there are several 
companies involved in the production chain or in the, in the development life cycle, for example, the hardware companies, the software, all of them are leaving their own trace in there, their, their own scent even. It's, there are, for example, uh, Chinese companies that are trying to, uh, you, 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 they put out these IP cameras in the sub $50 range, which is a very nice entry uh, gadget. And there are hard coded passwords in there, multiple of them, strange strings, a lot of, <laughs> it's, it's a lot of uh, entertainment for a f very few bucks. And yeah, along the production chain, it's very interesting to see who else was involved. This might be something you want to try out in your own hackerspace where you use something from the, the sundry money and just buy one of these little gadgets and take a look what you can find. All right, now to the weather forecast. A short remark. Uh, last year, we did already say that everything that can betray you will betray you. Everything will receive a chip. Everything will be given some memory and record things and will have a sensor. And uh, there, there will be hardware that will record at which temperature you've charged the battery or did not charge the battery and things like that, and whether it was too warm or too cold, and that surely someone will try to use against you by saying, no, nope, no warranty, uh, you are keeping things too warm, too cold. The battery went too cold, the classic with e-bikes, right? A modern e-bike was would be left outside at minus 10 degrees, and the bike would not work, and the maker would say, oh, come on, we can offer you a new one, but there's no guarantee anymore. Um, that's stupid. But, well, just uh, data, maybe something you can do about it, something, do something about it. So what you need is the log file stylist. And um, something that will become stronger is the distribution of the market into privacy business models. There will be the lower end, so the, the uh, sectioning of the market, the, the Asian cheap, business models that have never really heard about data protection or privacy. So they will give you the low prices and finance those by pre-made apps. So the model is you have a phone which costs surprisingly little and there are about 30 apps on that phone. Everyone buying, each one of the app makers has paid something between, I don't know, $25 around. Uh, so these are all system apps, they have access to all the sensors, all the data, and they monetize the data directly from the phone. So there is no platform involved anymore. The apps are doing it immediately, or they're building their own platform that way. So there's the staircase starting from that low end, and then you have thing, someone like Apple who say, we don't want your money, uh, sorry, we don't want your data because we already have your money. Uh, so the small amounts we could kind of express from your data, we don't want that anymore. And then there, there's everyone in between, such as Google with the Pixel f phones, who say, oh, it's nice that you've given us your money, and now we want a bit more from your data as well. Uh, and we want all your data, but don't worry. We will do no evil. Right. They're just for us. And this differentiation, according to privacy scales, that's something we will see more of in the next year. And it, it's worth looking closer there and s to see what the actual foundations in terms of privacy are. And the sad thing is that there will be people that will claim they have pr the privacy and are therefore claiming a higher price, but that don't actually have anything. There was this uh, publication, there was this notice at Heiser, the well-known German IT publication about uh, apps for children, and you just, you couldn't believe, if you read this, how they treat the data, what they claim their products to, to not do, and, and what they then actually do. The cloud is now getting all the data, so the motto, of course, is it's only secure in the cloud, and therefore it becomes the single point of whatever, including the 
previously mentioned blackmail. So door locks, heating, says the slide. Um, if you, as a group operator, you have a company company that uh, makes door locks that are connected to the cloud and they have 5,000 customers and you open those doors and you could say, uh, well, we could say, we could wonder whether the locks will open for every customer or would they get broken or would they just stay shut and stay shut and, and get broken at the same time? You could run a scaled business model there and uh, we wondered whether in the next year we'll have the first large case of API obsolescence, whether that will occur. This started because in my family I had questions like, oh, you know, isn't WhatsApp now going to stop in the next year if I'm still having, if I still own an iPhone 4 or an Android whatever? And the answer was, well, it doesn't really matter, does it? But many people do not see it that way. And I then wondered, right, well, what is actually the reality? And reality seems to be that certain things will no longer be supported by certain platforms. No one wants to do a 16-bit anymore, things like that. And uh, will that mean that as soon as someone changes something in their API for security reasons, uh, that suddenly a few million end devices will no longer tick because they don't receive any updates anymore to the new API. Yes, and we then w thought a while and then we said, no, probably not. Maybe they just would not dare or try to uh, still keep things running on the server side in a way that the old devices can still uh, use the old API and the new ones will use the new API and they just try to filter out certain things and uh, do this or whatever and uh, we've had enough problems already that was solved in the net and not through updates of the GSM phones for example um, so maybe nothing will happen Ultimately, well, these data mountains that will disappear, there are two points where things are developing that will get stronger. And one is the official digitalization that is happening. We heard about, we were laughing about the electronic health card in Germany, but there are other things there. Uh, the uh, lawyer's mailbox, for example, that was a huge fail in Germany. So people want to do more and more digitally and use less faxes and send less snail mail. And then we also had the issue that the notary's inbox um, existed and, and what you can see what you can read in the media is will simply blow, will simply blow you away, I think. A journalist asked kindly, even someone from politics, I think, whether an IT security audit had been made, and the answer then was that they didn't see a reason to do that because the makers are trustworthy. So if you summarize it, the digitalization strategy of today is tomorrow's data wealth. and. Who of you works in an institution or a uh, um, company that is busy developing a digitalization strategy? One of the interpreters is raising his hand. So about a third or over. So that seems to be a thing. And who of those that did not show up believes that companies should have a digitalization strategy, their companies, but haven't really started yet. 10%? Right. So, the incredible, if you have this incredible approach that we've just talked about, there is no reason to verify security. Then, the outcome will be in inevitable, but the other side is 
the invisible data mountains of shadow digitalization. Are you shivering yet? This is your aunt. Everyone who's using digital devices without really knowing what they're doing and who still have your data and process it and share it and then leave it somewhere. And this started with digital photography where you take photos and photos and photos and then you don't weed them out, but you simply put them on some disk somewhere that you have lying around and the disk suddenly is on the local network and then suddenly through a small mistake it synchronizes to the cloud and, it's, and when it stays there unless the makers change their business model and the fact that storage is getting cheaper and cheaper uh, this is not just happening in the homes, but in companies, too. More and more data is being stored and, and put somewhere, and people are not looking after the cleanup because, uh, they, well, so, so there will be unbelievable things coming together there. And if there is a dam breach in the data lake, data lake, nice, right? Data lakes exist in industry where they collected all kinds of data without throwing it away and then hoped that machine learning might extract something and then they realized that sadly the data aren't that usable for their purposes but they're still lying around because you know you never know something might happen and they may have they may find something to do with that data and the popular format of business areas and crypto and sport. Uh, this is the popular section uh, in security nightmares. Now, more companies have a cyber than uh, had last year. And so industry has understood that help is possible and there is incident response and emergency this and emergency that and people you can call if you had a cyber and they will help you to <laughs> kind of exercise the cyber, and there's so much more connected to that. Uh, you don't have to be an IT person to join in. Cyber emergency uh, helpline for people that um, have been affected by cyber incidents. And if you listen in on the industry and how they're mitigating it, and there are a lot of companies that have to do professional cleanup after this. For example, data data loss uh, reclamation strategies, digital <laughs> digital sorrow or digital grief. In, including restructuring the whole mess afterwards. But at Mask, they said, well, the IT was gone and the emails didn't work anymore, and then we just migrated to WhatsApp. So we were organizing ourselves over WhatsApp afterwards. And then we created groups there, and in the groups, we tried to uh, keep the business running. And afterwards, we were actually wondering if this might actually be our new company structure. The WhatsApp group, Bef maybe we don't even need to turn on the mail service anymore. They didn't say that uh, anyone who wasn't in the WhatsApp group was uh, terminated later on. So there's still a lot to watch out for in the future. And you also have the problem that how do you tell these kind of problems to the public? How do you uh, spread the word? So there's no really, really good way to explain it to the layperson because it's just gotten too complex. You can try to find analogies that are so broad that they're not really fitting and you could also try another way and look at it from another angle. If it looks like magic, maybe explain it like magic. So maybe do a fantasy novel. It has similar terminology and you you basically have uh, you, you were breached by a ransom gang and in, you could create a whole cyber fantasy about it. Demons have uh, breached the outer ring of the, f uh, the castle. They could uh, scale up the walls and go into our rooms and we now need to find pe brave people to go into the dungeons and 
hunt the demons and purge them from the castle. So you need professional writers who make a living out of explaining this in, in a way that makes sense for other people, like fantasy and magic. So at dawn you now have to <laughs> you now have to slaughter more cyber geese uh, but only at the full moon so Dan Kaminsky likes to say data wants to lie to you he wants you to be wrong data wants to lie to you and not a lot of people have understood this that their data lake is actually out to get them and this is important to understand and to train yourself in realizing that there is distortion in your own data coming out of the sensors out of the way you gather your data from the sources that you use and you have to train yourself to find these to watch out for them and it's basically the opposite of what happens today where people are being told yeah there's great things in your data and they're looking at the noise so long uh, until they see a pattern in there which is clearly bogus <laughs> so we have the phenomenon here that the migration to IPv6 took a lot longer than uh, we thought initially and uh, now it seems to happen very suddenly and uh, most of the, c the devices nowadays seem to actually understand IPv6 and they're, and, and they're, you see a lot of packets on your network and you're saying, well, wait, the monitoring and the firewall don't know IPv6 and your router doesn't and you suddenly have all this, this, uh, these packets on there. And now there is this new job of an IPv6 exorcist in <laughs> trying to purge these from the network. And later they have to retrain as the IPv4 exorcist in order to get rid of the old system and the old frames and messages. Turn around, I forgot to turn on the, cut the crypto. Did, this, this is the thing. Did everybody understand by now that it's important to uh, have crypto, to encrypt everything, that it doesn't work without cryptography, that it's necessary for basically everything? No one uh, uh, demands anymore that there shouldn't be any crypto. They usually just want a backdoor and an extra key. But the question is, is it actually on the whole time? or? Is it just there and not turned on, or if it's misconfigured, or does it have the wrong parameters, or maybe on some of the time, or on some of the connections, or did your uh, uh, software update break it again, turn it off, or maybe fiddle with the parameters, or this is, there's probably enough software out there that's trying to figure out if the cryptography is still on, and the question is if yes, how many of them? And we think we really should do something for the IT security. Click on each attachment in each URL for science. We're usually saying you should watch out for it. And uh, we're usually saying that the problem exists between chair and keyboard. But the problem is actually that the software is crap. Every software that I'm using these days should be able to to send data via email, to not blow up your computer, to not put it out in the internet unencrypted. To so the question, basically, the the message of saying, uh, don't click the attachment and don't click every URL. This is just victim blaming, and it's wrong, and we need to stop it now. So maybe we should talk to the unions and we should tell them that clicking every attachment in every URL uh, gives you more free time or earlier uh, close of business during the day. So this is a clear case of we can't keep going on like this and we need to escalate the situation to a fair degree. So now, from now on, click every attachment, click anything you can find basically. Use macros. Well, maybe, maybe not. Maybe, maybe still turn off the macros. 
So that is basically our appeal to you. And with this, we wish you a lovely uh, new year in 1984. And we see you again next year. This. Thank mm -hmm. you.